Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are a part of the School of Public Health, um, and we are hosting this wonderful Q&A today with some of our panelists, um, our, our Georgia State alumni, and um, the chair of the Department of Population Health Sciences in the School of Public Health, Dr. Gerardo Chow. Um, this Q&A is entitled Georgia State Alumni on the Front Lines, um, and our panelists will discuss their work tracking the coronavirus and how the community can um, prepare themselves, um, next steps, how we can move forward. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and have all of our panelists and our moderator introduce themselves. And we'll begin with Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Irukunapur, and I graduated from the Master of Public Health program at GSU in 2016. And currently, I'm a third year PhD student in the Environmental Health Concentration at Georgia State University, the School of Public Health at Georgia State. Dr. Chowell. Hi, my name is Gerardo Chowell. I am a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at the School of Public Health at Georgia State University. Uh, I'm a mathematical epidemiologist, so I'm very interested in investigating the spread and control of infectious diseases. And so we are very excited to be working on, on the novel coronavirus, including the epidemiology and developing predictions of the trajectory of the epidemic in different parts of the world. Thank you. Kimberlyn? Hi, I'm Kimberlyn Rosa. Um, I graduated with my master's in public health in 2017 from Georgia State, and I'm also currently a third year PhD student or candidate in uh, epidemiology. Um, so if we say epi throughout, we're referring to epidemiology, it might slip. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then I'm also a 2CI fellow and I focus on research in infectious disease modeling. Amna? Um, hi, I'm Anna Tariq. Uh, I graduated from my master's in public health and epidemiology from Georgia State in 2017. I'm currently a second year PhD student uh, in epidemiology department of population health sciences. Um, I work on infectious disease modeling and I'm also a 2CI fellow. Hi, uh, I'm Isu Lee from Korea now and quantitized for a week and left for a week. Uh, <laughs> I graduated GSU uh, 2019, the last year May, for the master's degree public health program concentration epidemiology. And right now, I'm working as epidemiologist researcher in the Dr. Charles lab. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, all of you, for joining us. Um, we're going to kick the conversation off with Kimberly. Um, we're interested in, to learn a little bit more about the work that you're doing with PPE. The research, I believe it's a joint collaboration with Emory. So can you describe a little bit about what PPE, PPE is? I know that acronym is being thrown around a lot in the media now, and most people know what it is. Um, and then your work towards the disinfection research on the N95 mask. Okay, uh, thank you, Homer. So my work is, first you said PPE. PPE means personal protective equipment. And this is just what a healthcare worker who is interacting with a patient that has uh, an infectious disease, this is what they put on to protect themselves so that they don't get infected when they interact with a patient. So the PPE um, that is recommended right now for the COVID-19 virus for healthcare workers is gowns and masks, and they have to put on uh, gloves, obviously, and a face shield or a goggle if they have that. So my work is really focused on developing a disinfection protocol for the, a kind of mask that is just not being recommended for healthcare workers to use in healthcare when they interact with patients who are positive for the COVID-19 virus. So um, th this kind of mask was, it, it became important to have this new kind of mask is called an elastomeric 
respirator, it became important to use to get healthcare workers to use this because what was from what has always been recommended for healthcare workers taking care of patients who have an airborne virus or a respiratory disease is an N95 excuse me, an N95 like you just talked about. And this is a disposable mask so between patient encounters. Healthcare workers are expected to put to change their masks to dispose the one they've used when they interact with patient one and then dispose that, get a new one and then use that for the next to four patient two. But right now there's a shortage of those kind of masks. And so it's important that healthcare workers have earned a different kind that can be reused and so that's what my work is on. There's a different kind of mask called an elastomeric respirator, like I just said, that um, I am developing a protocol on how they can clean up the mask, the disinfectants when they take care of one patient before they go you know, to interact with the next patient. What have you learned in your research so far? And I believe you have some visual aids as well, right? Yes, yes, that I do. So um, first, this, is what an N95 looks like. I hope everyone can see it. This is the disposable mask that healthcare workers would normally use in healthcare, but like I said, there's a shortage of those uh, kind of masks. And this is an elastomeric respirator. This is what it looks like. So um, these kind of the, the elastomeric respirators are, uh, they're made of rubber. So uh, we you, what I'm trying to do, like I said, is to try to get some kind of disinfectant agent and we're um, trying to test a few of them to see which one is most effective at removing the virus from this respirator so that when a healthcare worker has to reuse it for a different patient, they're safe and not being exposed to the coronavirus. Very interesting. So Kimberly, you, you, you developed, uh, well, obviously with your collaborators and your mentors, the protocol uh, dictates how this device has to be cleaned to to be sure that the healthcare worker is completely safe, right? Yes. And so we're, we're, this this protocol is being developed right now with um, Emory University Hospital. We're working with the Infectious Diseases Unit there, and they're providing us with the with the respirators and also on trying to understand um, the kind of wipes that they use already in the hospital and also some other kind of wipes that are commercially available. Uh, yeah, so this is a collaboration between Georgia State University and Emory University Hospital. Do, do I understand correctly that you are testing or developing this protocol in in laboratory conditions or in the real in the real setting where it's patients? So, uh, so, first, so first, we are trying to understand where first we're working with the healthcare workers to try to figure out where the mask is most likely to be contaminated. Then we're, as soon as we have that figured out, which we, we have, so we know the specific places, and we're then taking that information into the lab to contaminate the mask using viruses that look like the coronavirus. So these are sort of viruses that behave like the coronavirus, and we're contaminating those masks and then disinfecting them using some of the agents. I've, I think I've not mentioned them yet, but some of the dis disinfectant agents are a quaternary ammonium or some kind of alcohol wipe or a bleach wipe. Or uh, this also, we're also trying hydrogen peroxide as well. So we're using those kind of disinfectant wipes in the labs to try to figure out which one is most effective in cleaning out their um, the <laughs> the respirator and also we want to make sure that the protocol is standard and the healthcare workers can actually perform it so after the protocol is done it's going to be tested in the hospital with healthcare workers to see how they take up the protocol before it's actually to see if we need to change anything about it and then it will be recommended for use by the healthcare worker so we're, we're also working with them as well in the hospital setting Okay, how how well advanced is this? Do you think this will be put into into use soon for healthcare workers, or does it take a long time to be sure that this is completely well developed and safe? Yeah, it might it might take a while for this to be done. Like I said, we've had a shortage of of some of the disinfectant wipes just because of the outbreak. So we're trying, yes, so we're, the, the research is kind of not not really on a whole, but we're having to work with what we have right now. But um, as, as soon as we can get more wipes, I, I believe this may take maybe two or three months, within two to three months, we might be doing our testing actually in the, in the hospital setting. Yeah, is there something that you want to tell the audience 
Like, don't hoard on masks. Or <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Since these elastomeric respirators, we're still trying to figure out how we can make sure that they're safe for healthcare workers to use. I would say, like, leave the N95 mask alone. Like, don't buy those so that the hospitals can have access to those because, like, the healthcare workers are being exposed to people who have like high titers of the virus, like when they cough, they know, you know, they're spreading the virus in that environment. So it's very important that a healthcare worker has an N95 because the N95 is really very, it, it's been shown to protect healthcare workers in that setting where you can have like a high number of virus, like in the air or in that environment. So leave the N95 mask alone. That's my, <laughs> that is my recommendation. Yeah. Do you think is it harder to disinfect the mask, you know, against the corona, the novel coronavirus, or, or the flu, or is it about the same? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's gonna. I think it's about the same because, like I said, there there are a surrogate viruses that we've used in the past that behave like the virus. So we we believe that it's gonna be almost the same, um, you know, results we would get even with the coronavirus, like disinfecting it. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that uh, the virus probably uh, lives longer under certain temperatures or humidity levels. I'm not, I don't think you will get into that, but mm -hmm. do you need to test that, you know, this infecting process works at different temperatures or humidities or just on the worst um, situation probably? Okay, so um, what we will be aiming for would be a typical healthcare environment. Like environment. That's what that yes. So if yeah, yes, so whatever is applicable in the hospital or in the infectious diseases unit, that's what we will be aiming for. So a research at well, Emory Hospital, where the patient might be at Emory, might be different for a different hospital if the conditions are different there. Great. Um, and one more question. You said you need to you need to maintain the mask, the mask, right? You need to disinfect it uh, every few hours for every patient. You said, can you tell us a little bit more? Right. Yeah. So yes, I can. So the the mask, like I said, the recommendation for the N95 is to change it after a patient encounter because the mask has been exposed. The N95 mask. So for the new the elastomerics, it's also the same. We're trying to keep the protocol as standards as possible to make sure that they're they're disinfecting them in between patient encounters. So if you you know you're exposed or you take care of patient one, then you want to try to clean it and then you know go to patient two. And then at the end of the shift, there is a standard protocol that is already available for how to disinfect the mask. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, that will be at the end of the shift. And then you have to dry the mask out for the next time you use it, maybe the next day. But in between patient encounters, it was what we're really interested in trying to get the healthcare workers to quickly like clean it up within like maybe four or five minutes and then have the time to go to the next patient. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Koma, do you have any other questions? Kimberly, I'm interested. What type of mask are you wearing since we have to leave the N95 alone. What can members of the community do to be respectful of that? And what are you wearing out and when you go out in public? I, oh, well, I don't have one with me, but I, I think it's the wrong one. It's just a regular surgical mask. The one is kind of like flat. And I think a lot of people have those. It's a regular surgical mask that you, you can put on. It's not an N95, that's what I use. And I would recommend people using that because that is not what is recommended for healthcare workers workers to use. Although they can use it if there's a shortage of the N95, but then we don't want that to happen. So just use the, the surgical mask if you can instead. Great advice. And Dr. Chow, um, would you like to discuss a little bit about your work and your research and um, the panelists' efforts towards that? Sure. Yeah. So, so from the early days of, of this pandemic, uh, we have been busy putting at work uh, mathematical and statistical methodologies that we have, you know, that have been developed. Um, over the last decade or so to to measure things like the transmission rate of the of the virus uh, the transmissibility the severity 
and um, to try to understand where the trajectory of the epidemic is going in terms of how many cases you expect to observe in the next few weeks. Um, when do you expect that peak in incidence to, to occur? Uh, we have been also, um, well, I have been involved in a number of collaborations, uh, including uh, collaborations with my former postdoc and a research scholar who is now at Kyoto University. I've been looking at, um, at things like the, the role of asymptomatic individuals in the transmission dynamics. Um, you may have heard about that Diamond Princess cruise ship study um, that, that we developed where um, we estimated that about 20% of all the infections are completely asymptomatic. And, and so that, you know, that highlights the, the role of silent, the silent spread of this virus in the communities and why it has been so challenging to, to control outbreaks at the local level. And then with, with my PhD students, including Kimberly Amna, and uh, Giselle is not yet a PhD student, but she has a master's degree and she's now acting as an epidemiologist, data, data scientist, sort of. <laughs> um, we have been tracking, we have been tracking the spread of the coronavirus. In particular, Kimberly will tell you about the forecasting prediction work that we have been conducting since the epidemic broke in, in Wuhan, China. Um, and so she has, you know, for the first time, first time experience uh, forecasting a real right epidemic in real time, and then encountering challenges as you know the epidemic unfolds and uh, case definitions get revised and uh, many things that occur along the way. And, um, and then with Amna, we have been also looking at uh, measuring transmissibility looking at the impact of interventions, particularly in Singapore, um, since Singapore has been making some of the best data, epidemiological data publicly available. Uh, it has been so exciting to, to be able to analyze the characteristics of the clusters of cases, uh, the transmission trees, and trying to infer uh, how fast the, the virus is spread in some settings, and uh, Amna just got accepted uh, a publication where you know many authors are involved, including Kimberly and Yiseul and collaborator in Singapore Ministry of Health. Um, and so yeah, we we continue doing a lot of the forecasting work. And Homa, you are part of the team as well because you have been so instrumental in helping us publish this forecast uh, to the public in, in a really very nice way. So thank you for that. And now Kimberly will tell you also the work that she's doing in forecasting the epidemic in the United States at the state level. You know, we have been trying different models and making adjustments on, on things like, uh, you know, how much, how much noise and how much variability the data is showing. Um, you know, the challenges that you encounter when you work with real data, and there are many limitations, and so we have to, we have to deal with those. Um, yeah, more recently, we've been trying different models, forecasting the epidemic in the main hotspots in Europe, Spain, Italy, France, the UK. Uh, we're developing uh, longer term forecasts right now uh, to look into, you know, how the the trajectory of the epidemic would look like in different states in the earth, different states, um, like how the, the reopening of the economy in different places may uh, change the dynamics or not. Um, I can tell you about a collaboration with a media, major media outlet out there uh, where we are trying to predict uh, the size of the the outbreaks in in the counties where the NFL teams will be will be uh, training this summer. So we're working uh, with them on that. Um, yeah, a few a few things uh, every day. There is something new, something <laughs> to say no to new projects. 
so it has been you know challenging to keep up with the with the fluid story but at the same time we are learning a lot the students are learning firsthand on you know the epidemiology of a new disease so it's an excellent case study obviously unprecedented almost once in a lifetime and yeah so i'll stop there and i think they will tell you even more interesting things and thank you for explaining it. So Kimberly, would you like to let us know what you're doing with the forecast on the state level? Sure, so um, we're using state level data. Um, we're actually trying out a few different data sources just because um, nobody really has access to that real data, whatever that is, where it is out there. Um, but so we are using daily case data as well as deaths. Um, to generate short-term forecasts on the state level, meaning um, we'll fit a model to the data and then project it forward um, either a week or two. That way we can assess things like um, how many cases we can expect in coming days, what sort of trends the data is taking on, whether we're seeing a downturn in cases or if it's still increasing, um, when we might expect that peak or highest number of cases. Um, and various short-term projections like that. Um, we hesitate to make long-term projections because of definitely the uncertainty of the situation and the data. And um, so we would not be confident saying this will be the date where this is all over by any means. Um, yeah, so we're doing, um, we're using simple models for that. Um, models called phenomenological models, which means basically just that, um, only the data inform the model. So we're not incorporating disease specific information. Um, yeah, and we've been using these since the start of the pandemic because, um, because these don't require those biological information. Um, we can use them in early outbreaks where we don't know that information. So there are other models that use things specifically from the disease like infectious period or latent period and different things um, that have to do with each specific disease. And in a novel pandemic, when we have this new um, virus circulating, we don't know those yet. So using those simpler models um, allow for the data to do the talking and less assumptions to be made. So we actually have a question that just came in about what exactly are the models projecting and what has stood out to you in the past couple months since you've um, embarked on this project? Um, so they are projecting incidence case count, so daily incidence or how many cases we'll see each day um, ahead. So that's what we're fitting. And then we also do deaths in some as well, but same thing, but cases and deaths. Um, and I think one thing um, we've definitely seen, at least in recent weeks, is so a couple weeks ago when we started um, the, doing the, there was enough data to do state level forecasts. Um, when we started doing that, a lot of the peak timing was either expected to already have, based on the model, was expected to either already have occurred or would be coming in a few weeks. And now, um, so with the forecast I generated yesterday based on the data, um, this is no longer the case in many states. Um, so where they used to you know, project that we're gonna keep going down the curve here, now it's just kind of um, a lot more uncertainty and we're not sure that really cases are decreasing. So um especially with states starting to reopen i think we'll definitely see um more increases in case data and we're certainly not on that decrease that the models were predicting a few weeks ago can you can you say something about the first paper that we published the forecasting paper how you still remember that yeah yeah <laughs> uh, yeah so uh back in february we were um it was when it was still mainly contained within China. We were forecasting cases within China. Um, the first one we were focusing on Hubei, which is the province where it started. That's where Wuhan is located. Um, so we were forecasting Hubei and then all other provinces except Hubei. Um, and the all other provinces cases, you know, sort of followed well. However, um, a week or two after we published um, the forecast for Hubei, they changed the case definition, basically just meaning they changed the way they reported um, cases. 
So originally they were reporting confirmed cases as lab confirmed cases. And then on one date, they decided to start including clinically suspected cases within the data as well, without any sort of information on the distribution of that. And um, so I think it was an increase of about 14,000 cases or something like that in one day. So that just completely skewed everything um, with the forecast for that province specifically. But, but did, you, did you say that we published the paper in about two days and we make the prediction, <laughs> we, we published actually what we thought it was going to be the prediction based on the model? Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, in real time, uh, submitted and <laughs> Publish very quickly um, our projections for that. Yeah, definitely a different experience with publishing uh, than in the past, whereas normally you're waiting a few months to get your revisions. Uh, I think the process from when we submitted to got feedback to revising and submitting and publish, it was like online in a week. So uh, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> You still, would you like to um, talk a little bit about your the data scientist voice on the panel today, a little bit about your work towards um, this forecasting project with the with the data? And I believe you said you might want to share your screen as well. Oh, uh, yeah, can I? Because uh, right now is I can't share my screen. Okay. So, uh, I will just talk. So my job is data analysis, including like a collecting, measure, and arrange the data depend for the uh, purpose of the study. So for this outbreak, at the first time, like January and February, we focus on the China, Wuhan, which is the first country is outbreak, had outbreak. So for the data, for the China data, I collected the data from the, the National and Province Health Committee of the China. So the thing is that they don't they don't uh, save the previous data. So to save the data, I have to check every day at the same time because they uh, update like a couple of uh, hours. And I collected the data like a co confirmed data and the suspected like a cure and death. And after that, I also uh, we starting the about the Singapore, as Dr. Chow told about. So I collect data from the Minister of the Health Singapore. So for that, they uh, provide information about the case description. So I can collect the uh, data as a cluster. So I made a figure for the each cluster to showing the showing easily. And then after that, Korea has the hardest time on February with a case 31. So I collect the data from the cases in the Korea CDC. So the thing is that at the time, the Korea CDC is too busy, so they didn't provide the English version. But as I'm Korean, I can read it and I can mm -hmm. translate it directly. So this is good. So I can uh, collect the data from the case CDC for the Korea. And for the Korea, I collected like a cluster as a cluster and then what is a cluster can you tell us about that cluster what are the characteristics that it comes when building the cluster and the links can you say a little bit about that so basically cluster is uh most of the time is linked in place so for example for the link or uh like a place so for example in korea we have a big cluster like a sinjonji church so like a uh, the all all cases in that cluster is linked with that church. So cluster means the cluster in the case in the cluster is linked in that like a place or some other yeah. app like people. Yeah. What are the most famous clusters that you have that you have recorded? Yeah, in Korea is a Shincheonji cluster, of course. There's a so it's a 5,200 cluster size in Korea. It might be a little low than you expected, but in Korea is the highest one. <laughs> so, 
But the second cluster is at the size of the 166, which is very, diff very different between two clusters. Sorry, what was the other one? What was the second cluster? Where? Guro Cold Center is a cold center, is a cold center cluster in Seoul. Okay, yes, right. Yeah. And so we published papers very early with collaborators in Korea as well, right? Uh, in, in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases. And so it was one of the, the first paper assessing the transmission rate and, and describing these clusters, right? So it was really, yeah, it was really key that you collected all of this data in real time and you have been doing it every day at the same time. And then you share the data with all of us, and then we all contribute to the analysis. So yeah, it, it's yeah, it's been really helpful. And these days, I am focused on the country level, like uh, from the WHO, World Health Organization. So, and also some countries like uh, Italy, Spain, and Canada. And also, I collected the uh, United States. Uh, state level data from the Johnson Hopkins source as well. Right, right. So sometimes you have been reporting this data very late at night, right? Uh, I remember during the China uh, epidemic. Sometimes because it's not regular. So, uh, for example, the WHO uh, unload their report between like a, uh, 1 p.m. to like a 7 p.m. So I have to just wait when they unload it, and then I can do it. Just forecasting around the clock. <laughs> um, Amna, can you share a little bit about your work towards the project? I know Dr. Chow mentioned the figures that you produced for Singapore, and um, sure. progress on that. So, um, I have been working on Singapore data. Uh, we're trying to look at the transmission dynamics and the effect of interventions um, in different countries, including Singapore, which was very early on. Um, so we tried to see, uh, we use uh, case series data, which includes, uh, usually we try and get the data by the date of onset, but if we don't have that, we'd use the date of reporting data. So data by onset means when the patient or the case first exhibited a symptom versus reporting means when he or she went to the clinic or the hospital to, to see a doctor. So we use that case series data to um, to basically uh, use multi and use multiple approaches to see how the disease is spreading in terms of the transmission dynamics. We look at the cluster cluster sizes and we try and see how the transmission how the disease is spreading in terms of the cluster distribution. Um, like mo most recently, I have been involved. Uh, we're basically working in uh, Latin America, analyzing data for with our collaborators for Peru, uh, Chile, and then uh, we're also looking at Mexico data. So we're look, trying to look at, uh, so uh, COVID-19 reached Latin America around early, uh, late February and early March. Some of the countries like, Peru, uh, like Chile have been extremely vigilant in, in implementing early interventions. Uh, so what we see is that um, because of those interventions and we use the simpler models that uh, Kimberly talked about, the phenomenological models to forecast, forecast short term and see uh, if the interventions had an effect in lowering or stabilizing a case incidence rather than that keep on increasing. So like in Chile, we see that the interventions have actually resulted in a stabilization of the case incidents where some of the countries like uh, Mexico was a little delayed in uh, implementing interventions. So what happens is that the case incidents keep, keeps on increasing. Uh, so interventions in most of the countries include school closures, um, country lockdowns, curfews at nighttime so that people, um, so it's basically social distancing so people are not meeting. Most of the countries have canceled uh, gatherings of more than 30 or 50 people. Um, so we're trying to see how um, our transmission dynamics look like. Um, I'm not, the interim. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, what, what type of metrics are you estimating uh, to measure the transmissibility? What is that metric that you're measuring? So we're looking at uh, reproduction numbers. So reproduction numbers, basically uh, the number of secondary cases generated by one primary case. 
Um, and if we're looking at the this metric reproduction number in the very early stages of the outbreak before the interventions take place, then we call it the basic reproduction number. But uh, once um, the interventions have been put in place, then this metric is called the effective reproduction number. So like in um, Singapore, we were looking at the effective reproduction number because it already had implementation of interventions like um, closure of schools or bans on gatherings. But like in Peru, when we were looking at our data, we were trying to look at the early phase of the outbreak. So when the, when the disease transmission started and what was the reproduction number or this metric in that early phase uh, before the interventions were implemented. What did you report for Singapore? How is this reproduction number changing over? What can you tell so us about in that most paper? Yes, yeah, so most recently our reproduction number was, so reproduction number has the basic threshold level of one. Uh, reproduction number more than one means that um, the disease trend continues to increase, whereas a reproduction number below one means that the disease will decline or the trend declines. So for uh, Singapore, so basically we analyzed data for Singapore up until March 17th. That's when it was available up until the dates of symptom onset. So by that time, the reproduction number for Singapore was below one, uh, which means that uh, it showed that the trend for the disease was declining in Singapore. But like for, um, for some other countries, like uh, when we, lo we looked at um, Iran, um, in one of the papers with the collaborators, reproduction number was more than one, which indicated that the disease trend is continuing to increase uh, in time. Yeah, what did you account in those analyses? What, what type of data do you use? Can you say what is the type of data that you are analyzing to measure this so the, thing? A series data by the date of symptom onset. And we usually adjust it for the reporting delays, which is the difference in the number of days between or the time lag between date of reporting and the date of onset. Uh, and if that's not available, then we just use the data by the date of reporting. So like for um, for, uh, for Chile, we, we're just using data by the date of reporting because that's what's available from public publicly available data. But for Singapore, the data we used uh, was uh, by the date of onset. So we were able to adjust for the reporting delays. What type of cases did you analyze? What type of cases? In so we're looking, um, so we looked at the confirmed cases uh -huh. uh, in There's Singapore. What, what, what additional details do you look into? Um, so, uh, so like for, um, so more like the link between the cases, who infected whom, for the transmission clusters? I don't understand your question. Yeah. Did you look into whether the kid was imported or? Oh yeah, sorry. We oh. did look into the, um, yes, we did look into if the case was imported or if the case was local. So imported means it was brought in from some other country. So the person got infected in another country and he was he traveled to the native country versus local transmission means that um, the disease is spreading locally in the community. So person in, in the community is spreading the virus. Yes. We're also looking at the testing rates most recently in uh, Peru, Chile, and Mexico. So um, testing rates mean uh, how many people are being tested out of the community. Um, a higher testing rate means that not enough people are getting tested, uh, which is um, an indicator that we need to increase the testing numbers. Uh, sorry, the and we're looking also at the positivity rate. So if there's a higher positivity rate, that means that not enough people are being tested, but if there's a lower positivity rate, that means that the, the country is testing enough people in the country. Um, and for, uh, for Chile, we're, we're looking at much lower testing rates, but for United States, um, as the literature reports, testing rates are much, uh, the positivity rates are much higher, 20%. Yeah. Interesting. So what was the most surprising finding? Is that a hard question so far? <laughs> Um, well, it, it depends. So like in Latin America, we see so much variation between the countries, how they implemented the, the interventions and lockdowns. I mean, they knew that the virus was coming, but some of them were delayed in imp implementing interventions. And then, then they see an increase in case incidents now versus some of them that were pretty early on in implementing the interventions and they were able to control the virus spread. But like um, going over news and such, I was just looking like in Singapore, there's like a second wave of cases and migrant workers, which is pretty interesting. We haven't looked into that, but how the how the news and such reports, 
it's interesting and more than 80 percent of the cases in singapore are in those migrant people who are living in dormitories and yeah so things can change very quickly it was, it was so it was so well controlled for for almost mm -hmm. uh, two months and now we have uh, large outbreaks in these confined settings among uh, labor workers from other places right Im immigrant populations and that's right. because in like singapore that. about 1200 cases are the residents of the area and about 3000 are the migrant workers from like other countries like india bangladesh malaysia china so on and so forth yeah and the condition the living conditions right i don't Bad. know in a major role yeah living in highly confined settings and right. we know the virus is very spreading spreads very easily in confined settings mm -hmm. Dr. Chow, um, I have a question for you in terms of that, um, and I'm also just trying to be mindful of the time. In terms of what's coming next and uh, what we can look forward to in the summer, um, there's a lot of talk about a second wave of the virus um, or a, a second wave of the disease. Um, is there any insight that you can share about what that looks like for the community, things that we can do to continue staying safe and prepare ourselves? And then do you have any advice for the younger generation, Generation Z, um, or the millennial generation as well? Um, and what's what's one piece of pandemic-related advice that you've shared with people of this age group? Yeah, no, this is a great question. Um, so we have a new virus, and what we have seen so far is just the, the very beginning of the potential impact this virus could have in the population. Uh, there's potential for a lot more devastation in terms of number of infections and deaths, unfortunately. And the numbers uh, at the end of the year or, you know, within the next 10, 12 months will depend really on the policies that are put in place in the particular population and also on how the population decides collectively to protect themselves, to, yeah, to live with the virus. Um, so the, the, the near future doesn't look great, unfortunately. Um, I, I think uh, if I were to give a piece of advice uh, is that we, we, have to, we have to find a way to live with this virus and we have to find a way to sustain uh, protective measures at the individual level, in your family, in your place of work. Um, Probably need to be wearing face mask uh, for a long time, and um, yeah, being uh, obviously keeping a distance between each other, limiting our travel, uh, and and the outcomes that we will see in the in the future will really depend on how well it will be the responsibility of the different societies around the world and the governments in part as well. So there's uh, a lot more to come, and um, we we need to get ready for for that new stage, for that new phase of our lives, and uh, living with this highly severe virus that has potential to not only have an impact on your health but that of your loved ones, and and it's very difficult. Yeah. Great advice. Thank you. Thank you all for taking the time to speak with us today and share your insights, share your knowledge. This is uh, a difficult time for the world, but um, we appreciate uh, that we have this amazing knowledge pool and trusted voices um, during this critical time. So thank you all for your continued work and your continued research nationally and you still internationally in Korea. Hope you're staying safe. And hopefully we will all come together and see each other very soon when it's safe to do so. But thank you again for taking your time. And thank you to everyone who was tuning in today to the Q&A. Um, a link to the recording will be shared with all of our audience members today. So um, on behalf of the Georgia State Alumni Association and the School of Public Health, we wish you well and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Homa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.